wants to speak to no, oh, recording in progress. Okay. Um, we asked James to speak to why he's interested in joining Cinemopolis as the executive director. And as an executive director, to please describe the tactics and relevant experience that he will bring to Cinemopolis in order to accomplish the following goals. One, increase revenue to the theater via grants, soft money. Two, ticket sales at the theater. Three, fostering relationships with members and patrons. And finally, we ask him, we ask you to discuss uh, what you see and imagine as the future of nonprofit first run theatrical film exhibition. Welcome, James. Hi, everyone. Um, <clears throat> thank you so much for uh, uh, for letting me be here with you today. I'm really excited to speak with you. Uh, I wanna thank uh, especially um, Patty, Sue, Enid, uh, Kofi for helping this uh, get set up for this introduction. Uh, and so I really look forward to uh, to speaking with you about Cinemopolis and the future of Cinemopolis and, and what I can bring and what my vision would be for Cinemopolis as, uh, as the executive director. Um, <clears throat> so I'm going to share my screen and pull up this PowerPoint and uh, and then we'll uh, get going. So give me just a second here. Okay, there's that, there's that. Okay, all good. Um, so uh, I did want to, uh, I, I do have the prompt up here just to remind us, because I, I do, I think it's important to know sort of what has been asked of, uh, of me to do today. Um, and uh, uh, I think the, the tricky thing about this prompt and about what, I, what I'm going to try to convey tonight is that I really see a lot of the goals uh, and these tasks as interconnected. So as much as I was given this uh, one, two, three prompt that perhaps uh, perhaps you can read. Can I make this smaller? Where's my my mouse is gone? Oh well. Um, so sorry if you can't read all of that. But uh, this this the sort of ideas of increasing revenue to the theater through grants, uh, ticket sales. I assume that means increase in ticket sales or generating ticket sales, uh, fostering relationships with members and patrons, and the future of first-run theatrical film exhibition. Uh, uh, for me, over the last couple of years, coming from uh, from academia, but getting increasingly interested in um, in non uh, nonprofit arts and public programming, uh, I think all of these things are sort of intersecting at once for me. So if I'm not laying these out one, two, three, uh, I hope that uh, I hope that it can be seen how these things are speaking together and what I'm uh, what I'm going to present to you um, what I'm going to present to you this evening. Uh, but because we haven't met, um, I did actually want to start with just talking uh, about myself for a minute so that you all get to know me, because I think the other thing that is crucial to all of these questions uh, and all three, uh, all three or four of these ideas, right, is this sense of, uh, of building community, of having a mission, and of knowing uh, knowing what that mission is and who is a part of that mission, right? Which community members, who are your members and patrons, who are the people who aren't members who are coming to the theater, who are potential members, right? And then you need to know all of that demographic information, objective information, measurable data in order to get to the grants and soft money to increase revenue at the theater, right? So, so all of these things kind of um, don't happen without, without all of that. And for me, that starts from a place of, first of all, loving uh, film uh, and of growing and building community and of thinking how to make Cinemopolis um, but a, a community center in the in a in the a wide sense of thinking about what it can do for Ithaca in Ithaca and with organizations and partnerships in and around Ithaca, Tompkins County, uh, the Southern Tier, Central New York, Western New York, etc. So. Um, a little bit about myself. Uh, I, I was actually uh, born, uh, I wasn't born in Moorhead, that's a lie. Um, I grew up in Moorhead, Kentucky, um, about uh, an hour east of Lexington. This is, uh, this is an overhead shot of it. I wanted to include this so that you get a sense of, of the landscape of this small college town where, where I grew up, um, surrounded by 
uh, surrounded by the Daniel Boone National Forest. You see uh, the campus of Moorhead State University kind of nestled uh, nestled in here. Uh, and so, so I think you know when I first came to uh, to Western New York or, or Central New York as um, as a candidate for Alfred University, I immediately re uh, resonated with with this uh, beautiful area of the country. Uh, and even though there are so many differences, of course, between uh, Kentucky and the South, uh, and uh, and what we find in New York, um, I really felt like uh, this is an area um, that was familiar to me and that I understood as. Um, as an arts-driven queer kid from uh, from this town in uh, in eastern Kentucky. Um, but maybe more importantly than even the college here uh, was the university cinema. Um, so this is an image of uh, of the university cinema in Moorhead. Uh, I think this is an image from the summer of 2002. I did not take this image, um, but the signs, uh, Shyamalan's film tells me, I think it was summer of 2002. So I, I may have been gone this summer, but this was a one screen um, this was a one screen cinema in downtown Moorhead uh, and for a number of years was really the place where I hung out, uh, either here or Movie Warehouse, um, the video store that was a couple miles from here. Um, but for me growing up, uh, uh, having this cinema in the in downtown off of Main Street. Um, for me, film was initially a, a real gathering place for for me and my friends. It's and it's where within this 97% white Kentucky town that I encountered anything um, outside of uh, outside of what I really had initially imagined or, or outside of my own kind of representational position. Um, uh, and so this was a popular cinema, but over the years, uh, you know, I saw things like the Blair Witch Project, uh, Crouching Tiger, Hidden Dragon. That uh, was one of the first foreign films I remember seeing in a theater. Of course, I had the video store to supplement a lot of this as I got more interested in, in cinema over the years. Um, but this is just to speak about the way that this cinema in particular, like community and at least my vision of what or version of what Moorhead, Kentucky was revolves around this space uh, and in bringing, um, bringing my own sense of what I want Cinemopolis to be or what I would hope for Cinemopolis to be. Um, if this is tinged with a little bit of nostalgia, I, I would apologize, but, um, but I do think there's this, this sense of cinema being a central thing that ties together ties together community and ties together the arts, um, which is increasingly what my scholarship was interested in as I moved through uh, through academia, the intersection of film uh, with, uh, with the other arts. So from university cinema, which I will, sad to say, you, you, I'm sure you won't be surprised, uh, is no longer, uh, no longer um, a cinema. It's been converted into a coffee shop. Uh, and when you walk in the back, the cinema screen is still there. It's very very odd, um, but uh, um, but that's a uh, sort of a sign of the times as well. A multiplex entered, and our beautiful one screen theater um, went went belly up within I think like a year. Um, my journey has involved. I'm sorry if you can't read this on my uh, screen share, but I'll I'll cover that up. Um, going to several different places. So I'm highlighting here the cinemas of the Webster Film Series in St. Louis. Uh, that's I went to college at uh, Webster University and spent a good deal of time in this old converted church. There is a screen that pulls down up front, and this is where I saw a number of international classics for the first time. It's where I was. Um, uh, uh, it's where I was introduced to experimental film for the first time. Um, when I went to a master's program at Columbia, I spent a great deal of time at Anthology Film Archives. And then during my PhD work at Ohio State, um, this was of course uh, transferred to, to the, Wexner, uh, the Wexner Center for the Arts. Uh, and their their downstairs cinema that you see here. So this is just a little bit of my journey with different um, different theaters, and I thought I would uh, I thought I would show you all uh, them to to get a sense of of sort of where I'm coming from. Um, and then, of course, more recently, uh, this is an image of me with uh, the filmmaker artist Larry Gottheim, who came to uh, the Light Matter Film Festival this year. I'll talk about Light Matter a little bit more later. 
Um, but it's it's definitely what has been driving my my interests both uh, lately in terms of curatorial projects and programming, uh, and solidifying this sense uh, and, and desire on my part for a, a career transition um, out out of academia and into uh, into public arts programming and non uh, and nonprofit work. Um, so uh, all of this is just a little bit of background to show you the the sort of film. Um, my my film history, which would lead up to um, to what we what we're looking for and talking about today with Cinemopolis. Again, coming from a, a rural area in Kentucky uh, as a queer kid, um, cinema was again the, the thing that sort of held me to the ground, that gave me an outlet for a world beyond my own, um, and that uh, allowed me to meet people, to be in community with people. Um, and I think it, as scary as the last couple of years have been with, uh, with the pandemic, I do think slowly um, there's this uh, return to theaters, return to communal spaces, um, where spaces like cinema and the, the community center that Cinemopolis is and can be, um, can be really transformed in this moment. So I see a great deal of potential for thinking about things like the relationship uh, and partnerships between public and private enterprise, um, of developing uh, of developing Cinemopolis uh, memberships and revenue uh, through through um, through a tight calendar with uh, with um, particular uh, programming and with expanding our definition of what first run theatrical film uh, would be in the in the twenty first century and beyond uh, and in, in competing with streaming of course um, I think there there's a sense of of cinema needing to get back in some ways or responding to being an event, right? Like if um, uh, if if movie going is out, events are still in. Uh, and so in, in what ways can we create uh, movie going experiences, cinematic experiences that are uh, anchored in the community and giving us grounding to think about um, uh, to think about it and, and connect with each other in uh, in in a new way or in a maybe familiar way that that has been forgotten or something like this. Um, so I want to just talk about a few of the the sort of direct uh, prompts that that were brought up in the questions. Um, and the prompt for today. Uh, I mean, you know, of course, there's been a lot of discussion around uh, art house um, movie going, and as, as this calls the current movie going apocalypse, this recent article in IndieWire um, that I will say I'm drawing on a little bit uh, tonight, sort of staying a field of the questions that are going around. Um, but Eric Cohn in this article is asking if art house theaters want to survive the movie going apocalypse apocalypse, they need a collective strategy. And so I guess today what, I, what I'm presenting and thinking again about uh, both about grants, about ticket sales, uh, about uh, patrons and members, and about the future of nonprofit, right, this, this sort of sense of a collective strategy around, uh, around how to work that I think is central to what, uh, what I would bring and hope to, uh, hope to initiate at, at Cinemopolis. Um, and so I want to talk uh, briefly about the Art House Convergence. This is a uh, an association of uh, of people working in um, art house art houses around the country who have created this uh, network, as this says, of theaters, museums, film societies, film festivals, etc., um, that are speaking together and finding ways to communicate information to one another, both about their sales, about programs that are working, programs that are not. There's an annual uh, conference. Right now, this is a free thing to join. Um, so I'm not sure if uh, if Cinemopolis is already uh, on this or not, but um, I imagine that they, they might be, uh, but I think really, it, um, and as a new executive director, I think ingratiating myself with the art house convergence, um, speaking to other uh, directors and programmers from around the country, uh, which I'm already doing a little bit, but I think this would give a more kind of formal uh, place for, for Cinemopolis to, to sort of stake its claim. Uh, I think I mentioned this is free to join as of now, so there's no uh, no additional cost for being a part of this uh, part of this network. Uh, and I think it just is uh, is a starting point for thinking about how the future um, of of first run theatrical film um, can can keep going in in, in the current market. 
Um, along with this, I mean, there, there are uh, clear places for grants and, and soft money. Um, the NISCA uh, support for organizations, I know, is a, a grant that's been received by Cinemopolis before and, uh, and uh, is one to maintain. Um, the National Endowment for the Arts has this grants for arts projects uh, that they offer every year. I think the, the deadline for 2024 is February 6th, um, so that's coming up uh, relatively quickly. There's another 2024 deadline due in the summer. Uh, and so these grants for art projects um, could be uh, could be developed and is something that I'm uh, looking forward to developing with the board and with uh, with uh, our stakeholders and sustaining members for thinking about what these long term projects right not just um, yeah, what or what these uh, what these uh, what these projects can do and what they should be right because um, I think as much as I come in with uh, with a vision with background and experience, um, as I've said to the committee previously I'm also really driven by this sense, particularly again as as a new executive uh, director of interdependency, which is uh, listening to the people around you of listening to the people who have experience uh, over the years, uh, and who can inform your point of view and inform inform your perspective. This is particularly important, I think, both um, both because everyone should feel like they're a part of the organization and the institution. I think, again, the, the community based principle here is that is that, uh, you know, um, is that viewing right is driven by the people who come not driven by the top down and so uh hearing from others would help centralize this so uh, i want to um you know i'm not pitching a specific idea for these uh, as of today um that's strategic uh, uh on my part and uh, i you know i just think uh i don't think i should be coming in um with with guns a blazing on a specific project here that um that might be the one to foreground. I think that would come with discussion uh, and with dialogue. But um, over the last couple of years, I've taken professional development grant writing courses. Um, I've taken other courses in diversity, equity, access, and belonging. Um, and I know that grants projects are driven by that mission that are uh, sparked by questions in and around diversity in particular these days. Um, and so I think integrating my experience uh, working uh, and, and doing professional development in in both grant writing uh, and in um, and in diversity and equity access um, would, would help uh, would help give us footing in any any of these kinds of positions. Um, I'll also just note that I think, you know, I, I look from ProPublica numbers uh, over the last few years or in 2019, I believe it was only about 20, uh, only 17 percent um, of uh, of the revenue for Cinemopolis came from donations and grants. Um, there is, you know, I, I think the. I think that's important to think about and and, and to uh, and to grow, um, because I, I think that, you know, I think the the best run nonprofits have have at least some kind of even split of revenue of private giving and of uh, public dollars uh, via grants. Um, and so I think there again, there's got to be a way to integrate those things across the board um, so that one isn't um, so heavily prioritized uh, over over another. And so grants can step in in a, in a big way there. Um, I hope that you're already getting a sense of how I'm tying together your next two prompts. Again, thinking about ticket sales, patrons, members, uh, and I added here the community as well. Uh, and so I wanna talk about just a couple different initiatives that I sort of have in mind, um, but that even again, if, if all of these don't happen, I hope I'm giving you a sense of like who I would be on the ground in Ithaca um, uh, and who I would be for Cinemopolis, whether that's in Ithaca, within New York State, nationally, internationally, et cetera. Um, so first of all, I mean, and I've spoken about this before, but Light Matter has been an extremely successful festival um, over the last two years. It's only it just finished its second year. And its second year, we went from 400 submissions to over 3,500 submissions. We went from about 30 people at every screening when we only did four screenings, that's a total of about 120 people to an eight program festival where we had 50 to 60 per program. So that's uh, nearly 400. So uh, again, almost doubling in size. This is only within 
Alf, well, I mean, everyone was invited. We had artists from all over the country who came to this, but really the outreach here was to Alfred, New York, you know, a very small village uh, in New York. And so the fact that we were able to sustain touch, such attention uh, and grow the community so quickly I think speaks to uh, speaks to something that could really be a major annual event at Cinemopolis uh, and and be included potentially in a grant funded project to do uh, a series of uh, of experimental films or or sort of not even even necessarily experimental avant garde films but films that are seen as like pushing the boundary and pushing the edge of what we're of what we're used to seeing so. Uh, a film that's coming up in 2023, I very much hope is on uh, is on Cinemopolis's uh, coming soon page, EO by Jerzy Skolomowski, um, a kind of uh, uh, update of Robert Brisson's Ahazard Balthazar, a really amazing, uh, amazing film that would pair with a kind of thinking about experimental approaches to the media. Um, the same with this uh, kind of uh, gross image, but, but uh, of uh, from Dehumani Corporis Fabrica, the casting tailor and variety Monica Paraval um, documentary of, uh, of uh, surgical footage. Uh, this is being put out by Grasshopper Films uh, next year as well. It premiered, um, I forget where it premiered. I know it played at New York Film Festival relatively recently. Uh, and this could use, right, some feedback, some framing to draw in new audiences, right? Who is the light matter audience, right? It's not going to be the same audience as for all the other uh, initiatives and programs that might be on deck, right? Um, along with this, this doesn't have to be light matter, but of course we can go on with members only screenings or what I, M plus one events where a member is allowed to bring a guest, right? Uh, hopefully expand the member base and show them like, oh, the members get to do this. Uh, a lot of this can involve discussion um, and, uh, and discussion after screenings, things like that, that get them more directly involved with me as executive director who would be on hand, but also other community members and those who might be interested. Um, I imagine there are opportunities to pair with Ithaca Underground, who's sponsoring a number of experimental noise music shows um, and doing live audio visual performance. We'd have to see how loud those get in the theater and whether it just bleeds everywhere else. Um, of course, you know, there's logistical things here, but I just wanted to raise some of these, again, community partnerships available. Uh, and that's what I'm spotlighting here as well. Um, with a potentially an international book to screen series. You could partner with Tompkins County Public Library with Autumn Leaves Used Books, right? And Verkmeister Harmonies has a new 4K uh, next year. So this isn't a new film, right? But this is a new release. It's a first run release, right? So this is a way of blending repertory with new runs and, and integrating that into the fabric of what Cinemopolis is doing. But we could read Laszlo Krasna Horkai's Melancholy of Resistance, have a screening of Verkmeister Harmonies, right, and then have, have a discussion of this. There are plenty of other examples of, of things you could do, like uh, with this. Here's uh, Zama and Lucretia Martel's uh, wonderful film from Strand Releasing. Um, plenty of partnership opportunities with Cornell Cinema from the Cinecon Cultura uh, Festival, which is already going on. Um, their Experimental Lens Program is one that I would be interested in. Uh, further talkback events uh, and, or, and looking into visiting artists that Cornell Cinema might have. Could they program series at Cinemopolis to create even more dialogue and exchange between, uh, between Cornell uh, and Cinemopolis? Uh, I'm not sure if I'm running long on time, but I'll, I'll try to go through quickly these uh, just a couple couple other things here. Um, I imagine this partnership with o Opera Ithaca, thematic film programs around their shows, uh, and the, the integration of Met Live and HD broadcasts. Uh, you know, we're already doing this with theater. National Theater Live is showing this. This is already on the books for March, right? So I already am seeing this connection with theater and the other arts, right? And again, this opera audience, uh, I, I love opera. I will, I will gladly show up to all of this, right? But the opera audience might not be the Cornell Cinema audience, and it might not be the book audience, and it might not be the light matter audience. But what's really crucial here is imagining 
uh, this this too, right? Something that I would like uh, I guffaw at myself for including. It's included on um, IndieWire, uh, but thinking about television being brought to the big screen, right? Like again, this is this is all just saying who are the audiences who are being reached? How can we reach them and connect them to the theater through specific programming that occurs over the year? Right. And if there are a number of these, even if it happens four times a year, you can get a membership out of that. Right. Release the data of if you come three times, your membership pays off. Right. There are all kinds of ways to strategically strategically set this up. Um, and so uh, is that. Yeah, I think that's my last slide. So, I, I mean, I think I'm, I'm throwing a lot of ideas out there. But uh, what, what I really want to show is like from that upbringing that I have in a small rural area that that was driven by the community, uh, driven by the arts. You know, I, I've worked really hard to uh, to strengthen myself in in in, uh, in grant writing, in fundraising, in working with distribution. Um, and I would be really proud of all of these things. And I would be really proud to uh, to represent you all as uh, as the next executive director. So with that, I'll, I'll stop there, but I'm open to any questions, ideas, feedback, or or um, or whatever you're allowed to ask. Uh, James, if you can take down your PowerPoint slide, that would be wonderful. Oh, yeah. Thank you. I uh, want to thank you for your presentation. Um, my name is Kofi Cree. And talking to James earlier, he uh, was really cool about being called James, and he's also using the pronoun he and him as well. And has uh, folks are I'm waiting for people to raise their hands. I, your your presentation inspired a couple of questions that I have, sure. and um, I kind of like I guess I want to start with my last thought. Um, how would you come to this position? because you're coming in this position from an academic setting as a professor. Uh, and your presentation to me is very professorial in terms of what I would see in a classroom. How would you incorporate that style with the general public who may not be able to go into a classroom at Alfred or Cornell or Ithaca College and bring them into uh, Sinanopolis? Mm -hmm. Great. Yeah. Um, thank you. Yeah, I really appreciate that question. Um, I mean, I, I, I will say I, I, I hope that um, what I'm bringing is uh, is enthusiasm uh, and love of what I do and love of uh, of what I'm doing. Right. Um, I, I will. I, I did not read from notes tonight. So, so I mean, I am trying to I am trying to keep it loose and, and frankly, you know, I, 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 I'm a pretty personable guy, I think, and I want to get across um, that that sense of uh, of being someone who people can come talk to, you know. Again, growing up in Kentucky, I, I I didn't grow up around the arts really. I mean, I grew up around a lot of music actually. My stepdad was a, a bluegrass DJ, and my dad played music, so a lot of music, right? But uh, as far as like cinema goes, and even certainly as far as my academic like art art history goes, like those were not conversations that I was like used to having, right? And so um, as, uh, as, as maybe um, professional or professorial or, or whatever, as I come across, I really come from like being a quiet, humble Kentucky kid, right? Who, who really just loves this stuff and who really prides myself on being able to engage with any kind of audience, you know, from, uh, and, and that's happened in academia, of course, as well. You know, we have students at Alfred who, um, who have, who are from rural Western New York and who have never left the state. You know, we have, we have students who come into my classes who, who attend anthology and are from New York City, right? So, um, so I think it, it's, and it, it's not even, Frank, it's not even like code switching for me, you know, I really do, I really do think like, um, knowing how to talk to like the the starting point for these conversations is the same no matter where your background is so i really come at it from a place of of just thinking about like what do you love how can cinemopolis show you what you love in in, in a new way right like you know like I don't watch Stranger Things, for instance, um, but I'm not against a TV on uh, on 
screen thing, right? And I would be fascinated to hear from people who love Stranger Things or who love like that, who love this new era of TV, right? And I can learn from them as well, right? That goes back to that sense of interdependency uh, of thinking like I can learn just as much from the audience, from a general audience, as I can from the most sophisticated sophisticated audience, right? And um, so I think that's my that's my uh, general uh, approach, I think, and I, I hope one that would uh, that would come up, that would come across. I definitely, yeah, yeah. Thank I'll you, stop. James. We have three people in the on deck circle, starting with Jody, then Allison, and then Daniel. Jody, is uh, it's on you. Hi, Jody. Hi, James. Um, I'm a board member, and I'm also, um, I just retired uh, from being a communication professor. Okay. So um, I'm particularly interested in young people, and I wonder, not anything really specific, but what kind of strategies generally do you think are going to be helpful to get young people in the theater? Yeah, sure. Um... I mean, I, I'll add briefly here that that um, you know one of the the obvious one of the obvious things here, right, is is more social media outreach and finding ways of of integrating uh, of integrating Cinemopolis into social media of but not just of like putting up a post, right, but like tracking those. I, I know that I'm, I hope that I'm not being too silly, but but like tracking those numbers and seeing where they hit and where they're picked up, and you know, and what kind of audiences are responding when you post. What kind do you get the same audience when you don't? Right, you kind of have to do some toying around with social media to see what kind of pocket it's hitting. Um, I've done social media um, for both Light Matter and for the art history program here. So I have some experience working with kind of doing that myself, right? Um, and, and so that's some like digital marketing is something that I uh, am interested in and, and would definitely need to look, uh, look into. Um, but of course, yeah, I mean, I think the, the other part of that question, right, is that um, is that largely even to the, I, I'm not going to pick on stranger things all night, but like th th that represents that, that kind of streaming service um, idea that, um, that younger audiences are more inclined to stay at home, right? And so um, that's why I think, you know, you, you've got to think through like, you know, what, I mean, your question is the right one, like what's going to bring them, right? Is it a TV series? Is it a, is it a, a book thing that's integrated to a class, right? What kind of partnership can happen with Ithaca College and Cornell of course, to bring more students uh, just to the theater, to get them going to theaters again, right? To make that part of their routine. And so my, I mean, I was imagining it, it in this, right? Like that the Ithaca Underground connection, when I've gone to those shows, they've had, it's been a very, very young audience. Um, and so that was a specific program. I was thinking about younger audiences and um, audiences who who we might not be reaching. Um, you know, the opera demographic, probably a little bit uh, less so, but but I think that there are still, um, there are other opportunities there too. So I think for, you know, the one two there is, again, thinking about the sort of larger question of reach out on social media, uh, of of opening film in a way to audiences where they're not even used to sitting down for an hour and a half, right? Um, having different kinds of, uh, you know, maybe different kinds of screenings that have different kinds of atmospheres. Uh, but also, again, I would be I would be interested in hearing from you all at at some point, right? Of where young people, it, like what are young people in Ithaca doing? Where are they doing that, right? Who are sponsoring those programs? And is there a way to get Cinemopolis directly tied into those kinds of organizations, right? Like a board game night and Game of Thrones, right? I mean, the theaters are big. You can, you could do board games in the front during the day, have people buy concessions, right? There, there are lots of different ways to, to, um, to, reach the you know the cinema the cinemopolis it's like a makeopolis right it can be everything so um those are a couple those are a couple ideas um uh, thank so you james uh we have uh, my, my good colleague allison up next go ahead allison you have to take your mute off thank you yeah. okay hi james <clears throat> uh, i'm hoping that you could please tell us about a film 
or movie that's on your all-time favorites list? Uh, yeah, sure. I mean, um, there are a lot. My, I did. I posted a sight and sound list on Letterboxd in case anyone's interested. So you can find me on Letterboxd at J Hansen Out One. Um, I used to run a film blog. I was in the Central Ohio Film Critics Circles for a number of years. Um, so, I, so I have those bona fides there too. I mean, the answer that I should give you, uh, which is, I guess, the one that I will, is um, is uh, Lynch's Mulholland Drive, which I know made a big jump um, this year in sight and sound. I have a Mulholland Drive tattoo. It's under here, so you can't see it. It's the blue key um, from, from Mulholland Drive. Uh, I saw that film when I was 16 years old at a, um, at a uh, not, not a drive-in, um, at a uh, dollar movie theater in Dayton, Ohio. Uh, and it really was like the moment where I like walked into and out of the theater as a different, like as a different person. Uh, it really was like the moment where, where film seemed like something completely other than what I had seen before. Uh, and it like challenged me and I went with my family, uh, which was a mistake, of course, with my, my parent, my, my dad's a pastor. Uh, and my, you know, my sister was like 13. Um, and so this was early internet. And so I didn't really know much about the film. You know, I think I'd heard of Eraserhead or something. Um, but I think that for the experience, like made that really makes that like, when I, when I, when I get asked that question, Mulholland Drive is usually my default answer because of that, that experience and, and of how much it shaped, how much it shaped who I am. Um, I haven't watched it in about 15 years probably, um, but uh, it probably holds up, I, I suspect. <laughs> Thank you, James. Thank you so much. Next up is Daniel. Go ahead, Daniel. Uh, and by the way, we should notice that Daniel is sporting a very beautiful Cornell um, uh, Synanopolis uh, hat there. And they're for sale in the lobby of Synanopolis for those of our stakeholders who haven't been there in a while. And they have Anyway, I can go on about all the beautiful items <laughs> that offer. So go ahead, Daniel. Thanks. Um, hi, James. Uh, my name's Dan. Um, I'm an employee of Cinemopolis. Um, uh, part time. I work three days a week. Um, what I would like to know, and I'm going to read this because I wrote it down so I wouldn't screw up. Um, how would you, as the new ED, uh, utilize the day to day employees? to not only get the tickets sold and the popcorn popped, but to further your vision for the theater? Yeah, great. Um, yeah, I really appreciate that question. As a, as a former employee myself, I don't think I fit that into the talk, but uh, I worked my way through school working at movie theaters. I, so I was a, um, you know, I was hourly employee selling tickets and, and shoveling popcorn and I became a manager, assistant manager. Uh, and then when I moved to New York, uh, of course, I couldn't get a manager position, but I went back to just show, to 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 being a to being an employee at a theater. So I have a ton of respect for uh, for theater employees uh, and for uh, and for what they do. Um, and to your question specifically, you know, one of my good friends who I worked with um, at uh, at Cinema Village in New York City, if any of you know it, on, on 12th Street. That's where I worked for, for about two years. Um, and one of my friends who uh, worked there, right, was a writer at NYU and has gone on to, it, it, and was a, a executive producer of Insecure, Issa Rae's Insecure, right? Uh, and so, um, you, you never know, who, you know, everyone who is working at, in those spaces, right, I hope has a deep love and passion for film, right, I want to facilitate that. Uh, and once again, I'm going to go back to this idea um, of, of interdependency, right, I mean, I think uh, of the idea that that like the members that 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 you know um, someone who's working part time at the theater right should have a say should have a stake in what we're doing. So even when I'm mentioning these like talkback programs or these repertory series, frankly, I would love to have, uh, I would love to have employees curate series like, uh, and to, to work at least work with me on curating series, right. Or, or leading talkbacks. Like it doesn't have to be me. It doesn't have to be the, uh, uh, the general manager, right. It doesn't have to be a board member. 
Uh, I think anyone who's working there and spending their time there, putting in that labor, putting in that time, right, um, deserves deserves that. Uh, and so um, I would also, again, as I said, I would love to talk to the staff uh, and to all of you and hear hear about ways that you would like to be integrated. You know, you know, uh, I think that would again start with this community conversation around like, do you feel valued? when you work there, right? Like, I, um, I, uh, like, do you feel valued? Do you feel a part of what Cinemopolis is doing? Or do you, or do you just show up, right? Um, and some people may just wanna show up and that would be fine right? as well, you know, it's, uh, but, but if you want more than that, I would absolutely love for, you know, for any of those programs that I mentioned, um, for, uh, for um, Cinemopolis staff, to be a part of that, you know, you select the book, you lead the book discussion in that international book series, or, you know, if we have a visiting, if, if Cornell Cinema has a visiting filmmaker and we want to program uh, a series, uh, but we can only choose four titles, right? Like you come talk to me and tell me what you really want to see, right? I think it's the goal or it's the job of the executive director, you know, uh, to have a vision and to do these things, but also again, to listen to their constituents. It's like, I, you know, I, I, I'm not building a, I'm not building anthology film archives, right? Like Cinemopolis is not anthology film archives. And I, I, I know that, and that's, you know, um, so, uh, so I guess that that's, I'll, I'll stop there. Thank, Thank you, so you very much. We have uh, Sue's up next, and then uh, then I have a question. But other people can also please raise your hand, and definitely we will call on you. So, go ahead, Sue. It's on you. So my question is more uh, practical, uh, not necessarily about film. Um, so I'm going to ask you to describe the methods and practices you utilize to meet deadlines. Okay. Um, <laughs> That's a funny question. <laughs> uh, no, it's a, that's a good question. Um, methods practiced to, to meet deadlines. Um, well, I've been working on having more of a, uh, of using digital things to track deadlines and to, to sort of direct a workflow. I will say uh, my partner is excellent at that. And, and it is uh, it is not something that I have gravitated toward myself necessarily. Um, but uh, over the course of the, this semester in particular, um, I, I had my teaching responsibilities. You know, I had two uh, articles due. I had teaching deadlines due. I have grading due, right? So I, I am like constantly shuffling deadlines. Um, and I do a pretty good job of, of still keeping, I still keep a I don't have it in here. Like I still keep a manual where I just like do this by paper um, because for me, um, writing things down on paper really does cement it in my head in a way that writing it digitally just doesn't. Uh, and so I, this is this is a, a, a simple answer, but between doing a physical thing where it's like, I know, and I look at it all the time, right? So it's like, I know next week what's due. I know, like, I know what's due next week. I know what's due next month because I'm looking at my calendar all, all the time, right? So um, so there are ways of sort of, uh, of, of, of shuffling that. Um, yeah, I, I don't know. I mean, I guess a lot of it, it it's a little bit hard, uh, a little bit hard to describe like how, how that kind of happens. But I mean, I think for me, like I, I, I put a lot of, uh, I mean, I'm, I put pressure on myself to meet deadlines and adhere to deadlines. I'm good with deadlines. I haven't had an, I haven't had an issue with that. I think, um, if, you know, if you spoke to people who know me, I, I'm, I'm pretty solid when it comes to that, but I'm, I guess I'm also a little bit old school, uh, but trying to use, I am, I am legitimately trying to use some new, new digital, uh, software to help just help program that out so that, so that when I approach something, I know when I'm going to be able to come back to it. I know when, you know, when, when that's going to be met. So, um, not a very sophisticated answer, uh, maybe, but, um, but that, that's, that's been working for me, um, thus far. Thank you, James. Um, next up is Andrew. Go ahead, Andrew. 
Thanks so much. And uh, thank you, James, for your presentation. Uh, I'm a patron uh, of the movie theater, but also lucky enough uh, to have had many wonderful experiences bringing my classes from Ithaca College uh, to cinema and um, uh, enjoying all that it has to offer. So my question is really, if you could, uh, you've mentioned a few times uh, the relationship between movie theaters and uh, academic institutions. What um, relationships do you see and possibilities do you see within Ithaca and through Cinemapolis? Mm -hmm. Sure, yeah, great. Um, yeah, that, that's a great question. And yeah, I mean, I think aside from New York where that was a little more disconnected, you know, I think uh, everywhere, um, everywhere else I've gone has sort of integrated a cinema or a rep cinema or art house cinema directly with, with an academic institution. So I do think like for me that just, that approach makes a lot of sense, right? Like the Webster film series was directly connected to the university. Students could just walk over. Of course, there are student discounts or whatever, student member discounts. I think there are ways to, to push those to make, to make them more attractive to students. Um, but I also think, I mean, uh, I, I'll take this from the Gateway Film Center in Columbus, uh, which, you know, Ohio State University is, is massive, but they found a way to pair with their local nonprofit theater. And for a while, we're offering, um, uh, offering people to do lectures or run their classes in the, in the cinema space if it, was a, if it was a cinema program. I don't know if that's happened already with like literally running, running a class there, but I think that's, that's a way of getting people you know the more you get people to the theater in the seats the more likely they're going to come back there on the weekend right they see a poster of a film they didn't hear about or haven't heard of or something and they might cycle back around um there are definitely ways to uh which i think i mentioned but to integrate film series i think um i mean again for me i i want to be clear that i understand that this is a, uh, a first run art house uh, cinema, right? Um, and that it's, uh, that that's, that's what it is. But I think one of my things for the vision of this is that repertory is much more integrated. I mean, this is happening in New York uh, all, uh, all over the place right now with their nonprofit cinemas, right? Like uh, rep is, isn't, isn't like over there and first run over here, right? Like they're, um, they're, they're, they're being run next to each other. And so for Ithaca College, right? If there's a, or Cornell or, or wherever, if there's a, um, if there's a class that's being taught on a particular thematic subject, right? I would love to be in touch with uh, a professor to say like, okay, can we get a, a four program series for you? Can we get a six program series for you? You know, uh, and I think that's another way that like, you know, that grant opportunities would, can revolve around those kinds of projects. Um, and so, so yeah, I mean, I think that those are, those are some of the ways just about like literally getting again, students and young audiences in the seats and, and making them a little bit, making cinema back or getting cinema back in their purview and sort of directly working with, with faculty, you know, I'm, I'm totally open to that. And I think that that needs to be a part of what, of what a nonprofit cinema is doing. Thank you. Yes, we have Enrique and then followed by Olivia. Go ahead, Enrique, thank you. Hello, James, nice to meet you. Uh, kind of a follow-up question to what Andrew was asking, but more in regards to film festivals. I know you you mentioned that you you have your own uh, film festival, but I, I am coming from the Latino Film Festival in town, the Cine Con Cultura, which I'm the director of that of that one. And uh, so I I wanted to ask you the your vision, you know, the relationship between the independent theater and smaller film festivals like the one that I direct? Yeah, sure. No, <clears throat> um, that's a great question. And I will, yeah, and, and Light Matter is small too, right? Like two years, it's been a DIY kind of, frankly, a labor of love project that I'm just committed, committed to or whatever. So I mean, I think festivals are really great. Um, I think uh, I think there are ways of building those in throughout the year, right? That um, I think that the challenge, my, my frustration with festivals, this is uh, is just is when they move around, 
right? I really think you need you need to be able to like situate your audience for like that. I, I, I'm not sure when your festival um, happens. I have, of, of course, read about it. But if that happens, like, is that happening annually, like at the same time, right? Like you need to get your members, your patrons, your stakeholders, like, on a, speaking again of, of deadlines and stuff, but you need to get them on a schedule, right? So that people know when when what is coming up, right? Because th that's when you can actually market it. I think when it moves around, it becomes much more difficult for for people to to know what's happening or or, or whatever, right? So I see festivals as really crucial. Um, I mean, I, I think again, speaking of members and community. Festivals are ways of building that with that audience, right? Cinema uh, con cultura with the with the um, Latino Latinx uh, population. Um, you know, I don't know if there's an African film festival or film series. I mean, that would be fantastic, right? I, uh, I know um, there there are all all kinds of local outreach you can do to again reach constituents, find new members through festival programming right so so for me i think those it's really important to keep those alive um and and to keep them going and to again to to connect that as to make that really uh, really as local as possible you know, not in terms of the films right not it, they don't need to all be local filmmakers although i think there's great value in having like an ithaca filmmakers program too right right um but uh the programming can be global, international, whatever, but but the audience, right? Uh, who who are we finding there? So um, I'm not sure I'm really answering your question too much, but but I mean, I I I just think uh, festivals are are super vital. I think they build audience in a in a really direct, concrete way that is like trackable year by year. Again, for grants and things like this, we you need the data of growth. You need the data around revenue, and festivals give you like a weekend box to say last year we did this, this year same time we did this, right? Um, and so. Uh, uh, I, I'm aware of several other festivals that go on at Cinemopolis too. You know, I I would be, um, you know, I, I think it's just a matter of having that conversation and figuring out what's going to work best for the festival. Uh, but those things are are mutually festivals and with Cinemopolis that that should be 100% mutually beneficial. Oh, Kofi, I think you're mute. You're muted. You are so right. Thank you so much. Uh, we have Olivia. Then we also have uh, Carmen up. We can't see your face, Carmen, but we see the. Um, there we go. That that's oh, that's wonderful. Thank you so much. Hi, I'm Olivia. Hi. Just Lindsay. Lindsay has the question, but Lindsay. we're at work right now. Oh. <laughs> and and I pre apologize if this was addressed. We were like selling a membership, and you were on mute for a second. Great um, job. Right. Yeah. So. Um, my question is about what what kind of revenue streams other than regular ticket sales you are envisioning for the theater and what's your approach to and experience with nonprofit funding grants other stuff too right like and i just want to clarify this is the wonderful part of the wonderful staff of our theater so um go for it hey. yeah um, yeah so uh I mean, earlier in my talk, I mentioned specifically NISCA funding and NEA funding um, uh, as two projects that are coming up. I, uh, NEA has a February deadline for 2024, uh, for 2024. So 2023 for grants, of course, is already uh, already kind of done. Um, I do have experience, in, you know, working on a smaller scale with small scale grants. Um, uh, you know, sort of internal grants, some others. Uh, I have worked uh, at Alfred University um, with our, our School of Art and Design has has submitted uh, several grant sort of major major grant proposals that I've been a part of those conversations and a part of that dialogue. So I've been I've been in that conversation and in that process. Um, the same with the Institute for Electronic Arts, um, a separate separate nonprofit organization that's housed within Alfred. Uh, I'm a member of the Institute for Electronic Arts. Uh, I, I've served on its um, grant proposal committee. So I've been, uh, again, been a part of seeing the grant through, right? It sort of was set up on its own through the director there, but, uh, but I was a part in looking at the mission, making sure that 
who we're admitting for these artist residencies is fitting the mission, right? So that the grant, when it comes to the end, um, is uh, is everything smooth, you know. Um, so I have I have that experience as well. Um, this fall, I I just uh, recently have taken a. Uh, a fundamentals of grant writing course, right? Because I thought, even though I've had these experiences, I'm a confident writer. I know how to write an executive summary, right? Like I, you know, um, I, uh, I think I I will be very uh, good at that. I've I've worked with a lot of people who are good at that, but but I still didn't feel like I had um, strong enough experience. So I took that professional development course specifically to make sure that I was prepared to do what I'm telling you that I'm going to be able to do, uh, basically. So, um, so I think that, uh, grants are a major way of doing that. Um, uh, I mean, that's the main answer is, is seeking, uh, is seeking those out both from ISCA NEA, but also, you know, um, of course, of course, increasing, uh, other kinds of patrons and giving, um, and, and fundraising and philanthropy. So, um, but uh, I guess that's my that's my answer on, on sort of grants and revenue streams. <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, we have Carmen up next. I just want to remind everybody that uh, we still have a good ten minutes uh, for question. I do have a question ready in two or three actually in in the hopper. But what, Carmen? Let's hear from you. Okay. Hi, I'm Carmen. I work at uh, great. Um, great. Obviously, I'm not there now. Um, starting in the first quarter, New York State has made it so um, movie theaters can sell alcohol, beer and wine, etc. How do you think that that is going, what do you think that's going to do for us financially, impact us financially, and how do you think it will um, affect um, events, larger events, when there's the serving of and consuming of alcohol? Hmm, interesting. Yeah. Um, uh, yeah, I wasn't, um, I wasn't aware of that, actually. I, I had thought when I've gone, I was like, I, you know, like, I wonder why they don't sell beer and wine and figured there must must be a, a, a reason for that. I mean, when um, this is going way back, but when I, um, when I worked at Plaza Frontenac Cinema in St. Louis, uh, Missouri, um, they was a moment when they first integrated beer and wine and, and like alcohol, like a bar alongside the theater. So, um, there are a couple of different ways. I mean, as far as funding go, I think uh, as far as money goes, I think it's a no brainer. I mean, I, I think it's, uh, easy revenue stream, <laughs> Frank, with a high, with a high markup. Um, and so, uh, so as, as far as revenue goes, um, I mean, there. I can't imagine a, a scenario where where you wouldn't want to do that. Um, as far as events go, right? Then, then you need a different kind of monitoring, right? And, and you have to have a discussion with staff about about how to manage that. If some, you know, I, I don't imagine there would be any open bars uh, anyway, uh, unless someone really pay. Well, you know, I get. I guess I shouldn't say that. You never know. Maybe someone. So will you pay do. For that, you but. do support it, and you're looking forward to it as a revenue stream for, for sure. Yeah, yeah, what well, yeah, why wouldn't you? I mean, we need, you know, Senate from Cinemopolis needs revenue. You need to build revenue. Alcohol builds revenue. So, yep. so great. Pretty simple. Yeah. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you, Carmen. James, earlier uh you mentioned that um you have a career uh working in theaters, right? So I'm wondering, first day running, what happens to you? Because you know. In a small market theater like we have here, most likely you'd be wearing many hats. So, what does your what does your first week look like? I was going to ask you that tomorrow. <laughs> well, you're um, the one that's got this plan for the job, not me, buddy. Uh, um, no, I mean, uh, uh, sorry, just trying to be a little funny, but I mean, I think <laughs> I, I think the um, I mean, I think the key thing, right, is 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 Right. Uh, I mean, the, the key thing is for me to sit down and figure out like what what is going on and how that uh, and, and like how best to make sure that that we sustain what we're doing. Right. So I would imagine, um, you know, it can't be this jum jumbly thing like so uh, I don't know 
like who is responsible for booking, if that's entirely me, I think there's a general manager. Um, I don't know, you know, but I need to have a conversation about around like what, again, around deadlines, but what does the schedule typically look like? You know, who covers what, when, uh, and what, what would my, you know, like, what role do I play there, right? Like, am I on the, am I on the floor? Like, what, what's going to be most helpful as I figure out this transition? I would be pretty honest about that. I do think it, it's a, it's a, a, it's a new role. Um, you know, I have, again, I have the academic background. I know what a semester looks like on day one. I, I don't know what, what this job looks like on day one. Um, that's something that really uh, is exciting to me. And so I would, you know, I would, show up and I would meet with the staff and I would talk to the staff and figure out what the what the day-to-day -day operation looks like, um, what my role is in the day-to-day -day operation to make sure that that goes forward smoothly, right? Uh, and then, I, you know, um, once, once that's smooth and figured out and we have a calendar kind of figured out, like what's coming in, what's coming out, right? All these all these week-to-week -week logistics you have of running a movie theater, then I run in my office and I start researching the NEA grant that's due on February 6th, you know? Um, so, uh, uh, but no, I mean, I, th I think, um, again, the crucial thing for me is hearing from people. That's hearing from the board, hearing from the staff, hearing from the stakeholders. Uh, and I think hearing from them will give me that guidance on, uh, on what, what that looks like and where I am most needed, right at that at that uh, at that time in that week, right? Is it is it a is it a big opening where where that needs to be done more, right? Um, do you need me? You know, uh, so yeah, as you say, there there's a lot lot of deadlines, a lot of moving parts. Uh, I think I'm aware of the moving parts, um, but it's a matter of sitting down, right? Uh, most moving parts, it's a matter of sitting down and just ensuring that 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 I'm getting the team or that we're all collectively getting the team on the same page um, to, to move forward. Thank you so much, Jane. I guess the last question is gonna be for me. Okay. <laughs> not from me, but actually from me, but I'm not gonna answer it, of course. Uh, oh, we have a question from my, my good colleague, Nicole. So maybe she will have the last question. Thank you, Nicole. You got to there you go. Okay. Hello, James. Hi there. Um, I appreciate your presentation was starting off with giving us this narrative that you understand the uniqueness of Ithaca um, and where the cinema is uniquely located and how um, maybe our schedule or the schedule of the cinema will exist in terms of fall, winter, spring, summer, um, and when students leave and go and people are here. Um, I'm interested in knowing, one, how would you um, address those particular types of changes when we don't necessarily have the same kind of um, people in town in the summer, um, but there are people here in the fall and the spring um, that you know are here for school and other reasons why they're in town. How would you address that and this kind of idea around visibility um, to make the, the cinema more visible to the people that are here, but also um, your methodologies in, in which we think about intersectionality, um, diasporas, um, LGBTQ films, disabilities, like those particular engagements beyond just race, but how how would you engage multiple types of audiences and bring them into um, the cinema? Uh, great. Yeah, thank you. I, re I really appreciate that question. Um, I mean, first of all, on the on the schedule, uh, I mean, I think it's really important for nonprofits to get further ahead here and get like a set two month calendar, if possible, uh, at least for um, at least for uh, rep programs or those special series, right? Because I think in, in the way that I'm envisioning and talking about creating these series and these programs, I, I mean, for me, that is a way of addressing the second part of your question around intersectionality, around find, finding audiences and, and around, uh, around making sure that they're diverse audiences, right? And that we're not just representing Western European cis hetero filmmakers, right? Um, so, uh, so once that programming is in place, right, there, there's a way of, uh, of both having particular programs for particular audiences, um, also, but also, you know, as booking goes, 
you know, ensuring that that you're showing work from from all over the globe. As I yeah, as I said early uh, earlier, when I was in Moorhead, you know, Kentucky, ninety seven percent white town. Like my only vision of uh, of the world, you know, the first images that I saw of uh, of Africa or of or of Europe or of anywhere, right, were, were on screen, right. So I, I do think there's a really important way of thinking about the relationship that people have to media and to media culture in that question around intersectionality and representation. Um, and so one, I mean, just personal prerogative uh, to make sure that, uh, that we're seeing work from all over the globe. Uh, two, I think the individual uh, programs and series can build build in those audiences and again find audiences that we might not be reaching uh, or creating programs again with uh, with stakeholders, with members who want that, right? Like if you want to see something that Cinemopolis isn't doing, I want to be someone who you can email or knock on their door or come come by the theater and find me in the lobby and talk to me about what you want to see, right? Like I, uh, again, I have a personal vision and biases and things like that. Um, and I take stake of those and I have to take stake of those all the time. This isn't the and wouldn't be Cinemopolis would not be the James Hansen show. You know, we're not going to watch Michael Snow films uh, all all day uh, every day. You know, I hope they have a place, but um, but it, it's a community project. It's about the community. That means it's about you and making sure that it's serving you. Uh, and if it's not, uh, I would be really really adamant about making sure that it is. Um, and. Uh, yeah, and then uh, calendar. I mean, I, I think it. I think it would be useful to have a longer term calendar to to as much as is possible to build in like when these series, when these programs happen, even the um, when the festivals happen. Right, if your festival is happening when no one's in town, it doesn't. You know, it doesn't really feel very. It doesn't feel very good to to have to not have people come. Um, so so those are a, a few different approaches to your question, but it's a really important and urgent question. I Thank appreciate it. Thank you so it. much for your answer, James, and your question, Nicole. Uh, we're supposed to be ending at 8.15, and it's 8.10. We have Daniel, a very important person within our organization. If you can add, ask your question, Daniel, and keep your answer short, because I'm also interested in you telling us something that you want to elaborate on. But let's go with J Daniel first, because we will be meeting tomorrow. So uh, you can sum that up tomorrow as well. Go ahead, Daniel. Actually, in this entire process, I was told that we should ask the same questions and say the same things. So I just want to remind you all that tomorrow that the cleaners come, because oh. um, I know <laughs> that you all are going to be going to the theater tomorrow and I just want you to realize that there's going to be about 12 people who just show up and start cleaning um okay. and all right. all right that's good man <laughs> so James I just want you to because in these little interviews and we've been through I've been through them as well and sometime um th there's something left unsaid is there anything left unsaid on your part that you want to get across in the next minute or two, because you will be seeing some of us tomorrow, uh, search committee members, some staff members, so you can continue these conversations. Uh, but if, if not, that's okay as well, because I, I know how daunting a, a day like a night like this can be uh, preparing yeah. and delivering. Uh, that's a, uh, no, I mean, um, I just want, I can give, I can give a short answer and make sure we're, we're, we're done on time, but um, I mean, what I really want to, what I'm exploring and thinking about here, right? Because I, I, I do want to recognize and just admit and say again, like this is a, this would be is a career transition for me, but it's one I'm very invested in making. It's one that I'm working, uh, have been working on and working toward, um, and uh, and I would be thrilled if given the opportunity. You know, I've pushed uh, really hard. I feel like coming back to cinema and film in a way after. Uh, of course, I'll always love art history, but coming back to film is where I started. Film is where I end. It's it really is who I am at the end of the day. Uh, and uh, I think as as executive director and even as as friends, as stakeholders, as employees, right? I, I really feel like if uh, if we have that mission together of 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 
bringing a vibrant film culture, of living a vibrant film culture around one another. Ithaca is a place where that that can and should be happening, maybe all, already is. Um, I would love to be a part of that and uh, and grow that and uh, and and do that with with all of you. So um, I'll stop with that. Uh, perfect. You got two minutes to spare, brother. I want to thank you for uh, uh, presenting your presentation to us today and all the people who attended, including uh, staff, uh, board members, search committee members, uh, stakeholders, you all are important, everybody in this Zoom session. And uh, I look forward to uh, meeting you in person tomorrow, James. And, and as I sign off, see you at the movies. Peace. All right. Take care, everyone. Thank you so much.